My name is Matthias Steinberg. I'm the CEO of Locat. We are a big data analytics company that's working with e-commerce and retail. Essentially, we build applications that help companies take operative decisions, usually in real time, that might be in, in operations, in inventory optimization, supply chain, marketing, merchandising, pricing. Um, and uh, we combine cloud computing, machine learning, and data science uh, to do this. Okay. And my name is Thomas Ressler. I work for the World Wide Web Consortium. We do standards for the web. My focus is on the intersection between technology and society, privacy, security, open data, and similar topics. And I'll leave it at that for the moment. OK. Um, W3C is interesting. I mean, the, the, this whole, I mean, I think one of the things that fascinates me about this whole issue is the intersection of public and private here. We have a, a very unknown territory with it. You know, we have, I have this image of a kind of a data sphere that is, om is almost parallel to the real world, getting thicker by the moment, getting more granular by the moment, and its relationship with the world that we can see and touch is, is very direct, but it's also indirect. How do, you, how do you guys look at it? So I'll pick up on actually a phrase that Tim Berners-Lee uses occasionally to describe the web. He doesn't think of it just as machines that are our documents that are connected. He thinks of our applications that are connected. He thinks of it as humanity connected. And that is really driving to a point that has been part of the history of the internet and the history of the net of data exchange and filtering for a very long time. Back in 1960, one of the fathers of the internet as we know it today wrote an article called Man-Machine Symbiosis. And he started asking how can machines and computer networks help people deal with information, help, help people uh, work together, share data, deal with the data overload that we have. And that is actually the intellectual framework that is at the root of the group of researchers who then worked for Licklider and came up with that thing that we know as the internet on top of which we've built the web, on top of which we collect and exchange data. And so the way I would like us to think about filter bubbles and recommendation engines is not so much just about recommending a lolcat over a squirrel, but actually what we're talking about is society's nervous system. What we're talking about here is the shape of what collective conscience for humanity will look like going forward and nothing less. I mean, the, I mean, to, I mean you guys probably can speak to this. Uh, the amount of information that is available to somebody who's in here, you know, if you're in a business where you want to know things, there's an exponentially growing number of databases, each of which is exponentially growing in size. You, what, whatever you want, you can go out there and find third party. If, if you're not Facebook or Google with piles of your own, you can go out there and get essentially limitless amounts of stuff. Am I right? And, and, and my, my question would be, you know, is there some kind of singularity, I guess, to use the Kurzweil term, that where we're going to actually have so much that meta layer that I was describing earlier of data about the world, where we're going to be able to do quantitatively different things than we are now. In other words, you know, that, that lick lighter started it. When they started it, data was nascent. It was little. Now it's huge, and it's getting bigger all the time. Is there some gap we're going to cross that will let you do things that are completely fundamentally different from what anybody's done before? Well, uh, I can add a very, I think, uh, practical view from an uh, enterprise point of view. Um, what we see is that in the first big wave of, uh, of excitement about business intelligence tools, uh, I think the reality really stood far behind ambition. What happened was we dropped these tools in the laps of managers and said, well, now you have access to your data. You can slice and dice it and do whatever you like with it. The manager was sitting there, and uh, he was an operative manager, and he didn't have the time nor the time to learn how to do this. And uh, I think today we, uh, what we do is, and why we can create a lot more value, is that we start with a problem. 
and that actually dictates the relevance of all following decisions, not only which data we use to actually um, build the algorithm that will answer these questions and will create a value on an everyday basis, also how do we store that data, where do we store it, how do we access it, um, and this really, the relevance uh, uh, aspect of that is, is dictated by the problem. So, uh, I think... Relevance to the business problem. To the business problem, to the question you want to answer, to the decision you need to take on an everyday basis, be it often in real time, be it if I think of the web shop that is to some extent personalized, I go online very quickly, uh, the decision needs to be taken, how is that going to be configured, or in a store I have a checkout coupon, I swipe my loyalty card, what, what is the coupon that's actually going to be printed for me that will be relevant to, to me personally. And uh, so I think we have a concept where we go from something in business intelligence where you think we're going to try to do everything and nothing to uh, an approach which is very, very specific to a problem. So I think coming back to your question, um, right now we see that the most value is created by actually starting with a mindset of a very high relevance instead of having this, uh, this a very fuzzy definition of, uh, of what we can do with this data. Does, I, mean, I mean, I guess that there's really kind of two flavors of relevance is what we're saying. You're, you, you've got a business problem and the relevance to that. There's also the issue of relevance to a user in a, in a more of, a, a, of an outside perspective, looking in, you know, and, and, and is, I guess it's easier in the business context because you know what your problem is. It's a limited, it's a limited thing and you can make your own decisions and you also will make decisions, well, gee, is it worth paying X thousands of dollars to buy it? database why in order to get information you know you don't you don't really know so you you've got you've got a lot of limits if you're on the other hand if you're a consumer or a p person then you've got these unlimited unstructured problems that are are you know should i get my hair cut today or th those kind of things i think it's both um, you you have you have probably a much less uh, emotionally charged discussion with a company, if it's really about inside uh, decisions, it's based in ROI that's calculated. If I hire my company to build this application on an everyday basis, we're going to lower our inventory by X, have a higher availability. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a business case. Yeah. If it touches the consumer, for example, which coupon do I send? We had the, uh, the, the example this morning of Target in the US actually getting a lot of negative press with such a practice. There, I think I really need to, uh, or we see companies really need to have um, a much more uh, yeah, um, uh, nuanced approach to what should be done, what's techn technically possible, and what actually makes sense. My personal opinion is that companies are very, very, and that's what I see, very sensitive to that topic, and I actually believe that um, it can be implemented in the wrong way, and it can have very negative consequences, but it also can be implemented in the right way. For example, our recommendation engines that we see customers approaching us saying we want to make them opt in. Um, so the customer decides himself whether he wants a recommendation or not. He can even decide what type of recommendation he wants. And this is things that I'm not saying that the technology is there today to do it in, in, a, in a way that can't be criticized. But I can already see that we are able to actually create a lot of value for both the customer and, and the company. Well, Brian, I mean, one of the things I was, when you were talking, I was wondering, I mean, do you foresee, say, a, a search engine where you can literally dial up and down, you know, how closely you want something, let's say, you know, you know serendipity versus yeah. random, random chance versus totally targeted? I mean, do you want, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, to some degree. I, I would be interested if, a search engine would allow me to, you know, kind of work the dials, if you will, to say, you know, go out of the box with this, get exactly what you think I want, or also just to see, it would be interesting to see how personalization works for other people, right. and to get that insight into, if I search for that, these would be the top results, but if this random person with just a little bit of demographic information searched for it, this would be what the difference results would look right. like. I could see that being potentially very interesting, but it's it's a hard problem because I think people just want a search engine to work how they mentally think a search engine it's, should it's work. It's funny because it's not technically it's not a hard problem. It, it, it's not, but it, it's preparing the user for the res results that they will get. Right, but I mean, but, but I mean, you know, I, I, anybody that's in search engine algorithms can dial. They do that all the time, and. <laughs> That would to be to give you the, give the user the opportunity to do it themselves would be quite revolutionary. 
It would. The problem is I don't know how many users would take advantage of that ability. So on one level, that's true. On another level, search engines as we know them today, a lot of the big data work that we're talking about here is really about combining the things machines do well and the things humans do well. Mm -hmm. The value of PageRank is exactly that it evaluates human speech acts. It evaluates people setting links to pages based on their judgment and mines that knowledge. It mines human knowledge. If you take the best machine translation today, that best machine translation today is based on human translation. Take OCR, take reCAPTCHA, which basically just shows you the error cases from OCR software and puts your brain to use in order to actually solve those problems. So I think one of the changes that we actually see through the network is the combination of human and machine intelligence and putting each of those to work on what it does, well, it does best. And perhaps one of, the, uh, one of the ways to think about the contrarian view is how can we get people who actually have the broader horizon to tell us that this is an interesting contrarian view and how can we mine that information in turn? I think it's not just about the algorithm, it's not just, as we heard in the previous panel, about the algorithm with the ethics module. It is about understanding what humans think about as ethics and, mora uh, and, uh, and moral, and it might be uh, even more about what humans think about as interesting contrarian perspective and really mining that. Mm -hmm. I think it's more than just, the data, than just machine data that we're talking about here. It's a subtle distinction, but I think most machine learning algorithms are based on human labeling. I mean, to some degree. I mean, right. you have clustering and you have that, but most machine learning is, is done with inherently, even if you go back to the old way, you know, these are the problems. A human came in and labeled it. I wanted to learn that human expertise. I think exactly. the, the, human, the human side of it is, is hopefully integrated in <coughs> automatically. It's not, I, I mean, I, even, that's modern machine learning. Even past when people tried to build expert systems that didn't work really well, they did bring in the experts and ask questions and try to build these, these systems. I don't think we can ever, I think it's disingenuous to imply that algorithms aren't people or haven't been heavily influenced by the labels so people far. put or the bias. Yeah, I mean, it, algorithms will write algorithms sooner or later. That will just happen and it will feed in. And, and the process is, it's very hard to get people to sit down and label things. It just is. It's, it's expensive, the quality's bad. So you want to have people implicitly label. And it's what happened with machine learning. It's when it took off. It's when people realized the UN had all these translations across various languages. We could, we could get that. I think the, the, the problem with uh, the human angle is often that uh, is essentially cost and scalability. Um, if uh, I don't think there is any discussion around adding human intelligence can, can create a lot of value in, in combination with the right tools and algorithms, probably will, uh, that's my personal opinion, often come up with better uh, results than a pure algorithm. But how do you scale that and how do we make that cost efficient? And I think it's very clear that that's not possible. So if I, uh, you know, you read a lot of companies that have tried to build a business model around personalization, if that's my if that's actually the value I want to provide to the customer today, uh, it's very difficult to do that with the existing technology, but that does not mean that the technology can't not, by smart people like Brian, uh, develop. And these, uh, I read that they are converting back to a human curation, mm -hmm. which works better. That's true, but how do you scale that? Exactly. Um, so I think an example of this is the relaunch of DIG, which right now, it is, it, is a, it is a two process to decide what goes on the front page. There's an algorithmic filter process that kind of limits how many stories that these editors can choose from. But sooner or later, an editor sits down and says, that's interesting. Put that on the front page. I think that's going to be good. And then if it gets enough traffic, the position of it moves. It, you have to combine these aspects. But at the same time, as those editors keep labeling stuff, I would be remiss in not taking that information and putting it back into the system mm -hmm. and keep going. And that's what's going to allow it to scale. It's a constant iterative process of you build something to help filter down a little bit. You take some humans who filter it down more finute. You learn that process and you just keep going. 
Well, it's interesting. If, if, oh, oh, go just ahead. went from one. There's two different uh, points where humans, at least two where humans, come into it. One was what you started out with. Mm -hmm. Why can't people? Uh, at least I think you did because I want you to. Okay, that's uh, why can't people fine tune their? Why can't they personalize their personalization engines? And the other part being the one you were talking about, the, 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 back, the back end. And I think it is an interesting question. I was hoping you, would, you might have an answer to that. Why search, uh, why, why recommendation engines are still so bad? I mean, this, uh, people have been working on this for at least 20 years. Um, Amazon has a huge financial interest, as has Netflix. And I almost showed a slide very similar to yours with the Amazon recommendations, only mine had the first 10 recommendations and they were all by the same author and yeah. this happened last year. So I don't know what these people are doing all the time. Um, I think there has to be some sort of reason why improvements are slow at best. Um, I've, I start feeling on, on panels like this. I start feeling, uh, start to feel like someone who keeps saying communism isn't bad. It was only badly implemented. Because I sincerely believe that recommendation systems are not bad. They're just badly implemented. But how can they be? How can they remain that way for so long when there's? Uh, I suspect that there has to be some better reason. Well, isn't that what, true? What, that, what I mean, it, that's, that's, been, that's a that's a true description of all of artificial intelligence, actually. I mean, it's always been, you know, five in five years we'll crack it, and it's been that way s since 1960. Yeah. And um, I think it's just it, they are very hard problems. But I mean, one that would be one of my questions: you know, is is there is are we going to get to some kind of you know? It, in, in my mind, there's two pieces to the puzzle: there's data, and then there's algorithms, and you need both. We've had a massive. The data side is just going out of control now because the, you know we now are networked up. We're getting vastly better information than we've ever had. Is that going to change the ability fundamentally of those? Will those algorithms finally work? You know, now that they have enough ammunition, let's say, to to go. I don't know. I mean, I, you guys. That, that's my question. Uh, let's see. Defending the field. Uh, yeah, I agree. The Amazon algorithm. <laughs> It's, it's, it's good in some ways, but it's not great in other ways. I think you, you got that. It recommended you, you know, five books by the same author, but most likely you bought, you bought a book by that author. You know, there was, there was some signal that, if you just think of it from like a probability of Bayesian point of view, there's this huge sample space, and I got to pick 10 books to recommend from it. You know, I'm, I'm going pretty safe. I'm going to recommend you authors that you've read in the past. I'm going to recommend you the most popular books from the fields you clearly like the best. I'm going to recommend things that are critically acclaimed in the fields you like the best. And that's not a bad strategy. And until someone creates something a lot better that takes money out of Amazon's pocket, what they're doing is good enough. I think that's the thing. I think we all want incredible AI revolutions, but there comes a point where you can t <laughs> lose my voice, sorry. You can take 10 years to solve this, or I can create a good enough solution in two weeks. And when I have to show the investment of the cost of my time, the good enough solution is good enough. And I think that's what, especially for AI, especially for algorithms that end up on the web, a lot of it is you got a problem 95% of the way. A lot of people focus on the 5% that you didn't do great. But to get to that 5% is going to cost an amazing amount of money, and you might not even solve the 5%. And I think one, one aspect is also how do you define it works or it doesn't? How do you define success? If you as a, as a consumer, you look at it and you say, well, you know, if this is an effort in personalization, I would really be expecting more. If you look at it from Amazon's point of view, I very sincerely believe that actually it does work to the point where a completely random suggestion will have less conversion than, than, in, than the implementation they do have. So if, if my standpoint is I want this perfect personalization, we are far behind. If, my, if I look at it from Amazon's or from a company point of view, I'm interested in improving the status quo. And I think these, these technologies that exist already, they actually are able to do that. I suspect that there is some sort of reluctance on the part of developers to have consumers meddle with their algorithms, which is why there are so few uh, options to 
tune the algorithm the way you want it to. Yeah. Last FM has a little, uh, uh, some sort of, you can, you can tune it a little bit towards uh, more exotic or new recommendations, but uh, really right. it's next to nothing. Um, and I know this is, I, I don't quite believe these arguments that uh, it's good enough because for Amazon this is uh, this is money. It's, uh, if it if it was a bit better, they would make more money with it. And, and but but did you did you quit using maybe. Amazon after you got those bad recommendations? I would certainly. Uh, sometimes sometimes I spend an hour uh, wading through the bad recommendations, looking for something I could buy, and I, and I won't, and I don't find anything that looks uh, remotely interesting. I think it's a success that I kept you on the site for an hour. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, uh, there's there's that. I, I uh, recommendation engines, I think, on, all right now are erring on the side of I, I'd be safe and not want to offend somebody. And that sounds really weird to say, but you Even kept looking for an hour, you weren't offended, you probably bought something from Amazon since then. They didn't <coughs> lose you as a customer, but if you came in and I, I said, you know what, satanic verses, take a look at that. But you have more than one type of user, and even if you only had one type of users, they would be in different moods at different times. Yes. So with yeah, music recommendation engines, uh, they sometimes let, do let me shift. Let me shift the discussion. I, mean, I think everybody understands that when you go to Amazon, they're a store, and they're trying to encourage you to buy certain things, and you wouldn't be shocked and outraged to find that, let's say, author X had paid them to show you 10 of his titles. I mean, you. On the other hand, a search engine, a pure search engine like Google, there's a, this is a different. There now, someone's coming looking for information. Okay, they're not. They're not coming to look to buy something. Mm -hmm. We all know that, in fact, algorithms are tuned to produce certain results. But there is this constant undercurrent about Google: <laughs> Are they putting their finger on the thumb? Are they? Scale. Are they? Are are they? What's going? On? And how do we feel about that? I mean, uh, Google is is a business. It does have advertising. It doesn't promise. Perfect. It's well. It kind of does. In their in their in their statements, they will say, "Oh yes, we don't. Oh, we're absolutely neutral." Uh, in fact, we know they're not. And how far can they go before they start to be troublesome? I think there is an interesting undercurrent in, in this discussion and also in your question, which is, which goes back all the way to the earlier conversation about scalability of some of these things, scalability of the human computing in it, and about implicit versus explicit feedback. The conversation we're having here is about why don't they let me tune the algorithm and why don't they let me give explicit feedback. Explicit feedback is the one that scales poorly because typically I'm not in the mindset of wanting to tune the algorithm. I'm not in the mindset normally of wanting to guess what Google might have put in there. But I'm actually giving implicit feedback through browsing on that site for an hour looking at 10 books and only buying one. That's a huge amount of information to tune the algorithm that I'm giving right there, and the same applies to a search engine. What links do I click? Where do I go away? Where do I stay? Where do I maybe even follow the ads that are in context? So what you actually have here is a case where implicit feedback through the use of the service, A, permits to tune the algorithms, B, permits me to give feedback about the sort of uh, feedback about the sort of thumb on it, as you put it, the, the sort of uh, manipulation of the algorithm that might be going on in the background. And it's perhaps an interesting example to look at some of the security mechanisms implicit in f sites like Facebook. What they do is they run machine learning against the entire set of transactions that go through the site. They use what they call adversarial machine learning and try to identify the patterns of abuse. And that in turn is a part in part a value judgment. What are the things that are bad for the site? And in part it is just based on the implicit feedback users get. They create additional feedback loops. They might keep an interaction back for a while or just take one of a series of interactions and let the keep the others back and see how that one works as a sample. So there are interesting ways to design algorithms in a way that really uses the user's feedback to make value judgments. There are also, of course, there are also ways to build feedback loops that can help 
to uh, feedback loops that can help to keep the, shall we say, conscious manipulation in check. But is, on, the, on the other <coughs> hand, is it an issue if, a, if the humans who are working behind the firewall of an organization like that one can manipulate and can choose? Yes, it is an issue. And in that case, transparency becomes hugely important. And to take an example there from Google, if they get a DMCA notice to take a result out of the search engine, they actually send that off to a site called Trilling Effects. And uh, you will actually find a pointer at that on the search results side. That is the sort of feedback loop and the sort of public feedback about judgments made as part of the social system and as part of the operation of a service that I think is incredibly valuable, incredibly important to avoid unseen manipulation of the nervous system of society. Uh, oh, oh, by the way, we will be taking questions shortly about both the session here and also the talks before us. So if you have a question for either of the speakers, uh, this will be your chance. Uh, put up your hand. Oh, here we go. We got them already. <laughs> Let's go to the mics. Here we go. Okay, Stefan here. Uh, I have an observation regarding recommendations. Um, if I remember uh, occasions when I um, when I w went into new mu music, for example, or someone recommended me good music, I have the feeling that usually it was like uh, at first sight I hated it. You know, so I remember my brother pointing me to Portishead, for example, and I listened to the record. And I said, I, I thought, oh my God, you know, does he really think I like it? Uh, and uh, later on, I loved the music. Um, and uh, I can remember many occasions where it went like that, especially when I, when I uh, figured out really new stuff, you know, that really drove me something or really enriched, you know, my sense of music or whatever. So if you would translate that into an algorithm, it, it comes a little bit down what Brian said, you know, with, uh, with the heat uh, uh, same thing, you know. Um, it's completely the opposite what you would, as a developer, you would try to design, you know, because you would have to confront the user with something he hates or he doesn't like, assuming that later on he will start liking it. D do you share these observations or is... Yeah. Uh, I think it's... Uh, I think you were patient with Portishead because you knew your brother to be a reliable source of recommendations. And if recommendation engines were much better than they actually are, we might be able to trust them and they might be able to give uh, strange recommendations and we would give those recommendations the time they needed. But right now, I don't know a single site I would trust in that way. I think uh, Katrin makes a good point. It's uh, in in uh, in a lot of these things. It's really about also about trust. Um, I don't. I think uh, Brian's presentation was very impressive because it really showed that I don't think there's per se a limit on what technology can do. It's not that uh, technology will always be confined to basing recommendations on what you've clicked on before or you've read before. That's I think we are probably at the start of a long journey of creating better recommendation engines, but as Brian said, there's ways, he has asked a question, he doesn't have a solution, but to actually uh, address also the desire to, for example, to foster discovery. Um, and, uh, and I think that that will be achieved at some point. Um, but probably one of the, the ingredients you will need is to build trust around a recommendation if it is at first sight to the consumer something he, he does not recognize as being valuable to him. Okay, we had another. Yeah. Hello, I'm Geneviève Petit, French journalist. My question is for Brian Earth. I loved your presentation and uh, I was wondering whether you have some examples of uh, new things about making conversation between intimate enemies. Yeah, at this point, when building these algorithms, there's always this question of what people feel comfortable with and being very safe. Um, when I first started working at Bitly, there was this concept of public and private links, that people would encode stuff, but they didn't want it to be publicly known versus private. And just coming from a lot of machine learning, I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could recommend people you should make this link public or you should make this link private. 
given your past history, given this content, given people who say this content historically make it public or private. And I thought, this is a great idea. I'm so smart. It's going to be so successful. Look at that cross-validation score. High five. And, and our CTO rightfully so said, we're never going to put this out. We're never going to do it. Because no user would want to come and see a link and have us go, you should make that private. Just imagine that, how uncomfortable that would make you feel. And I didn't think of it that way. I thought of it like, look, I got 99.98 .98 accuracy. I'm great. You know, everybody's going to want this. But it's that concept of how do you push an algorithm forward, but also understanding making people comfortable. And, and for ex you, you made a great example. Your brother recommended you something. And you gave him a lot of rope. You were willing to try it and then try it again. And you know, when it came on, you listened to it again. At this point, algorithms haven't, especially because of the cold start problem, they don't have enough trust to do that, that you forgive them for inherently making a bad recommendation, which might down the road become a good recommendation. You know, if you went to a site and it recommended you something and it was terrible, you're not going back. You're not giving it the benefit of the doubt. But, you know, you care for your brother, you have a shared history, you're going to see him again. You, you might keep giving him the benefit of the doubt or just take it as read that he, you had particularly different taste on this. And the next one will probably be good. So I, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's understanding what people are comfortable with, what people trust from other people versus an algorithm, and how do they handle that. Uh, just one quick remark. Uh, I know you're next. Uh, well, I, I find it a bit irritating that wh while we are talking about personalization, everyone seems to uh, suppose that all their users are the same, that when you say the users don't want it, I'm sure there must be some people in your user base that would, who would want exactly that same feature. Oh, Why can't you make it opt-in? Of course, but it, that's when you, you start to go against the issue of engineering resources and scale. And just this idea that we are not a big company. We are growing, we are successful, we are not huge. There's only a limited amount of attention and resources we can give. And if I keep a box running for n amount of money and a small percentage of our, of our user base loves it, I have to question, is that a big enough percentage? And that's just, that's just economics at that point. Yeah, I would love to make algorithms opt-in, but at the same time, you know, how, what space does it give in the memcache? How am I, you know, these become engineering problems that you have to have to do. But yeah, I, I think that's, that's a presentation issue also. How do you present something to this a user that says, hey, we got this feature, you might like it, you might not, give it a try. Please don't be offended if you don't like it. Just quit using that feature, don't quit using my site. Do you know does it with labs? Gmail does do it with labs, but also yeah, that's, that's, a, that's an excellent point. And they have, but they have the resources, I think, to let people opt in for that, but yeah. I think we, we do things like that to some degree. We have a feature flag that we allow certain people to use certain features before, and it's something we should consider doing more often. And I would, I would be for it if just nothing from, I would get better usability, better feedback that I can once again put back into the algorithm. I guess we could be optimistic and say that in the fullness of time, those kind of things will happen. It's, I mean, it's not a philosophical objection that anybody has. It's, it's just a practical thing. Right? I think in, in practice, how do, maybe I can, I can add a perspective. How do we go about building these algorithms? I mean, what's, what's the, the outset and, and why do we end up with something which to many users looks so bad in terms of implementation? I think the, the fact is it's hugely difficult. Exactly for the point is if I'm building a couponing optimizer for 5 million loyalty customers, I have 5 million individuals with very individual um, preferences. And I think we are very, very far from being able to take that into account. So what we are starting with is saying we have 5 million users and our metric, it's machine learning, Brian mentioned, we, we build systems which are calibrating and learning themselves because we have a clearly defined metric. My couponing example that is how many people that have been shown these coupons are actually going to use them. And we say we have 5 million users, we implement this algorithm and actually our conversion goes up. We have a delta, we create value, we can even put a, a business case on it and we will implement it and use it. And then we will work on improving that. But I think, so from a company perspective, there's already value created, obviously also from a customer perspective. But this ideal of having every customer uh, really liking the, the, the desire, the, the um, personalization 
I think it's, it's a very, very complex problem also for, for, uh, from the technology point of view, and we are far from being able to address that in that detail. Okay, out there. Yeah, well, one thing that I, I think is a bit slowing down the, the um, whole process of um, personalization is the success measuring, um, because that is a very, I think, um, everybody does it on his own, how to measure the success of recommendation. And I think also many product owners are afraid of um, having to manage five million different products, um, which is really the case if you look at it as a very individual thing, which it is not in my opinion, because it's, you build clusters, so there's no, not five million different um, and products, but there will be versions of it, and you need to think about how you measure the thing, and maybe you have. Um, ideas or solutions that you can recommend that are more than me building um, like um, uh, groups in, in Google Analytics, for example. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, we, for example, uh, I meet uh, marketers that, uh, that say, look, my problem is I'm, I have X million uh, customers and I have seven customer segments. Like, just read McKinsey says you can't go over 10, 10 customer segments because you will not be able to manage it. So we have seven customer segments and, and I'm told, you know, how do I person, and my desire as a marketer is to personalize the communication to the individual customer. Uh, how do I do that? And helping to, to get closer to that ideal is uh, what we are working on. But I think we are very, very far from giving each customer that individualized um, uh, communication. One thing that is being done, everybody has, has probably heard of regression analysis, there is with big data uh, the possibility to do that on a much bigger scale in a more complex manner, where I, for example, instead of starting uh, with, with, with segmentation or clustering, I really start with individual customer and I try to uh, identify custom, other customers that have in one some way similar, a similar behavior or similar interests and I try to derive from all these other customers what well, actually, for me personally, might be interesting uh, of a product or content that I have never clicked on, I have never read. This would be maybe a more, potentially, a more, uh, I want to say scientific, but less random approach than, than as Brian said, as a, as a provocative question, let's just give him something that, uh, that fits the criteria that it's as opposed to what you might like as possible. Okay, anybody? Okay, over here. Um, I found it very interesting what, what Brian suggested and, and the examples he showed about people having conversations uh, which were very interesting because these people were so very much in contrast otherwise. But I think, uh, and this was one of my ideas when I thought about the bubble and how to cope with this serendipity problem. Just have a kind of slider saying how much contrasting views I want to have in my suggestions. But I think from a business point of view there will be a big risk doing this. Just imagine, for example, you go to a party where a famous host arranges seatings of people and she always tries to place you near someone with an opposing view. And I would think that in most cases people would get angry because in one of ten cases there might be really an interesting conversation but in many other times you would say, oh, what a boring guy, or I couldn't stand it hearing over dinner how he always contradicts what I said. And this might be nice for finding interesting conversation partners, but if you want to sell stuff, books, for example, or music, I think you run a high risk of alienating your users, and it's what someone else said, it's hard to measure success. Because maybe sometimes this one in ten nugget you found where you were really happy accepting something which you never would have considered as being nice or interesting to you, this might be very, very interesting, but how will the machine learn about it? Because the machine just sees in nine out of ten cases, I rejected the suggestion. So what does the machine do? Being controlled by a certain KPI, it tries to find similar things because with similar things I might choose the suggestions more often than not. So how to measure it and, and how to yeah, run around people's tendency yeah, to like similar stuff. 
I think it's all about it. And it, the, the, the movie scenes you showed were very yeah, impressive, and I remember them too. But how often did I meet people with opposing views who made me really angry and not brought, brought up new ideas? So it's hard to measure. We talked about those different types of personalities when you call a call center or your seven customer groups. There's a lot of research on how um, different people have different interests in novelty. Some people are actively novelty seeking, some others like things to stay the same. Why is everyone suggesting that people do not like novelty as a whole, uh, that, that, that no one likes it? Um, there are different personality types there. I, going back to your 9 out of 10 and 1 out of 10, I, I would love to make recommendations like that. If for nothing else than that 1 out of 10, I can learn new features that I wasn't looking at prior. Like what made those, those interactions that for whatever reason shouldn't work but somehow did? What feature was I not looking at? What was I not taking into consideration? But is it worth me? taking that risk to learn something new if I potentially alienate 90% of my audience. And that's the risk. That's what you're saying. And you're right. The, the filter bubble does not get broken if you give someone with a totally opposing view. If you are, if you are a, 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 in, the, in the States, if you are a liberal, me recommending you rush Limbaugh doesn't make you kind of understand conservative values more. It makes you think, I'm so happy I'm a liberal. That guy's a jerk. Right? In the same way that if I, if I know someone who's, who's, who's a, a Christian, I might recommend them to read Richard Dawkins. Very much an atheist, but I think it's an intelligent man who makes some intelligent arguments, who I think, despite having a different viewpoint, will not insult or offend someone else's viewpoint. And, that's, and it's trying to find those type of connections versus if I have a friend who's a Christian recommending him something written by an atheist who talks about how Christians are stupid, that got him out of his filter bubble, I guess, but it didn't really work. It didn't open his viewpoints. Stefan. I have a direct response uh, because, um, okay, one, it was only one out of 10, which was okay. You know, if I take the Portis hat uh, example I gave before, no, I would still be listening to Chris to work uh, nowadays if, if I wouldn't have followed this one out of 10 approach. So, so what I'm saying, or I think uh, this conversation between Al Pacino and Robert De Niro was well, very valuable for them, you know, if right. you follow the, the movie. So it was worth 100 times than, you know, a, a, a common sense uh, a recommendation. And I think it's perhaps it's an easy problem uh, at the end of the day, and we have to feed back better to the algorithm which is really valuable for us you know so if i would tell amazon you know once i uh, i digged into portis hat uh, this changed my life somehow you know i went away from crystal work that's amazing so please algorithm learn this kind of disruptive uh, stuff and 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 teach me more of it perhaps not every week you know but <laughs> because i wouldn't be able to to uh, Go with it, but uh, to, to perhaps it's a simple feedback problem that we're not uh, taking, you know, this kind of feedback which is really valuable, which is really disruptive, or really makes a point for me, and which is just, you know, like okay, I buy this shampoo because uh, it look, has the same color as yesterday, this kind of stuff. In my understanding, this the the, the problem that has that that this, uh, this example is describing. Uh, it, it basically is in existence uh, completely independently of the algorithms that I use, or whether I'm talking about algorithms or whether I'm talking about a host trying to curate his, his dinner table. I think that that problem simply exists, and whether it's an algorithm that makes a, a recommendation and that will put need to make the decision to put people that already know each other very well uh, together and so they won't have a, a new conversation, not discover new people, or do I actually mix it and run the risk that people sit next to each other that hate each other? I think that, that problem I always have, independently of the algorithms, then the technicians uh, have, have the challenge of how to actually then, depending on what is desired, how to actually then put that into effect. I have a question for you. Um, it was funny when you mentioned the, the customer or the client with seven buckets of people. A, a marketer from 50 years ago could have said exactly the same thing. He had the same seven buckets. Um, 
personalization clearly hasn't actually gone very far if we're still talking about seven buckets, each with 20 million people in them, has it? What, what's yes, it's, uh, I find it astounding as well. Um, I think it's, uh, it goes back to what, what Brian, uh, Brian said, why, why is there so little change? I think marketers will do what, what works best uh, to their, uh, within the means that they have. And clearly there's a lot of companies out there in retail, at least, uh, that's my example, that uh, need to still are relying on, on these customer segments and it works better than having no customer segments. But clearly they are interested to understand how they can improve it. I think. To give you another example of a retailer in Germany that is, uh, they are very proud that they can go down to, to customer uh, uh, segments or clusters with I think 20,000 customers. So here we don't have, um, have hundreds of thousands, but 20,000. If you want something very personalized, you're probably going to be offended if uh, what you get, another 20,000 people in Germany will get. Um, so yes, marketers are very, very interested in improving that and I think we can help them. Um, but in the end, it will be a, a stepwise process where each time uh, we can prove with our application, with our algorithms, that we create value and that is simply increasing the relevancy a little bit. It will be implemented and we'll make a further tiny step towards the holy grail of that really individualized So, so in fact, one-to-one one -one marketing ought to have quotation marks around it. It's not really a, it's a, it's kind of a concept, it's not a reality. <sighs> Yeah, but then the question is, how do you measure it? What's, uh, right. What does reality mean? What's a good one-to-one -one marketing? If I have the time to, set, to decide which content is sent to 10 customers, which I, I would have, if, um, you know, is that, am I going to be able to do that well or not? How do you measure that? So I think one-on-one -on -one marketing, uh, we're making, I think, big strides. We're improving, and that's, in the end, the, the driver that will actually continue this process. Now, just for clarification, I don't mind uh, being lumped into one bucket with 20,000 other customers. I, don't, I, I just think there's a problem to have the same seven buckets apply everywhere. You are in one group when it comes to one of your habits or preferences or whatever, and you're in, an, in a totally different group Absolutely. on something else. So you just want, don't want to spend your whole life in that one bucket. Absolutely. And that's what marketers understand. That's exactly what, what they say. How do I decide which bucket to, to put that customer in? Yes. And keep him there. Yes. Um, one right. of you. So, Oli, um, after being involved for like 15 years in personalization in all kinds of different ways, <clears throat> I actually would like to get the perspective of the panel um, regarding two seasons. First would be there's no information overload because if you put a student the very first time at a university's library, let's just have a look at it. Oh boy, how am I going ever to manage this, right? So um, you just have to learn how you deal with it first. So um, second, personalization is just a commercial feature. It makes total sense in coming up with the most uh, interesting products, the most interesting advertising and all the like. But at the end of the day, can a recommendation engine really be better than a human being being aware of what it's looking for and learning how to actually look for an opposing view and so on and so on? I'd really like to get the perspective on that because for like 15 years I'm chasing this one and I, I'm kind of disappointed. Okay. okay. Uh, the first PCs of information overload. Yeah, I don't think we suffer from it. I just, I, I think it's the same concept of people who tell me how hectic their modern lives are. Like, I'm so busy, I have so much to do, it's, it's in, stop doing so much. You know, if information overload is a problem for you, stop, stop throwing yourself into information. Like, yeah, I think it's a self-control issue. Is there a lot more options? Yes. And, but I still think people don't necessarily have the incredible difficulty in picking information. Maybe they don't pick the best, maybe they don't pick the most unbiased, but they still can pick information relatively well. I think the overload is, is taken. Um, the second one, yeah. I, 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 I do believe that algorithms can be a tool that help people do the process you describe more efficiently. I don't think they'll ever replace it. I think that I'll give you an example. If I went to Twitter and I said, I want to I I follow someone new, 
It would make no sense for Twitter to list everybody on the service alphabetically. Just wouldn't. That, that wouldn't happen. But they could filter it down significantly, and then I could use my intelligence to decide from that filtered list who to follow. And I think the filtering will get better, but it's never going to replace an intelligent user who kind of has some ideas um, making the decision. So I think that filtering will get better. It has gotten better. It will continue to get better. But it will n I, I don't foresee me going to Twitter and saying, I want to follow someone new. And they go, OK, we put them in your graph. We, we got it. It was a, you know. I don't think I'll go to Google and I'll say, hit the search button and it'll return to me what I wanted. I still have to give a query. It still does TFIDF. You know, I think a human makes a decision at some point. We just, are, these algorithms are just filtering it because if giving them all possibilities would be death. One, one, sorry. Oh, okay. Are you finished? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I think the central problem with this human recommendations are a better uh, thought is that we do not have any metrics at all on this. We have pretty good metrics on the, rec on the algorithm part, but the other part is just uh, some vague recollection of uh, a good recommendation you got from your best friend, and you just re disregard that his other nine recommendations were pretty bad. So it's when you when you when people ask you to uh, describe the way to the train station, there's two different ways you can do that. One is very popular; people like it when you give it when you give the information to them that way. But uh, when you uh, have an empirical study, you find out that they do not find the way to the train station as good as with the other one. That is un unpopular; people impo yeah, people don't like it as much, but it helps them. And I think it might be the same way with the personal versus algorithmic recommendation. I would like to say that uh, in, in practice, the choice is, is actually not between uh, do, I, do I choose human recommendation or do I choose algorithmic recommendation because I just cannot scale. I mean, I cannot scale in a cost efficient manner human recommendation to actually uh, provide to my customers, to my users, uh, a personalized uh, um, uh, experience. So actually, I'm rather deciding between. Uh, an algorithm, yes, no, or a very crude human uh, recommendation or no recommendation. Mm. Yeah, but that's or, I, or I make a decision between one human uh, recommendation and a set of human recommendations that I can draw upon with the help of an algorithm. I think in, in some of this conversation I hear our algorithmic overlords come around the corner. And I think that's a very dangerous way to think about either building or using systems like these. I think we need to think of them as tools that extend what we are able to do, that ex help us to extend our cognition and give us a broader reach. And so the question is more, how can we build algorithms that feed into the human decision that is a, that ought to be the decision at the end of the chain and make that a better decision rather than saying, how can we build algorithms that make the decision instead of ourselves? I think that's really the core distinction this one is uh, driving toward. Okay. On that note, we are out of time. And so I'm going to thank our panel. And we have lunch. <laughs>